Hello, hi everybody. So uh, today uh, I'm going to talk to you uh, again. <laughs> um, I'm going to talk to you about uh, EDI and in particular uh, the OCA EDI framework that I had the pleasure to, uh, to create and work on and with some other contributors. So let's start it. So uh, quickly, a few words about me. Uh, I'm Simone Orsi, I'm 39, I'm from Rome, I'm a Python full stack developer, Odoo developer since a long time, an OCA board member. And uh, normally I'm an open source adept, I always work in open source and I try to avoid any uh, closed source software. And I work at camp to camp as Alexander said, and I, you can find, him, find me everywhere, basically uh, as Simoke, GitHub, Twitter, Discord, Gmail. Okay, so let's see what we're going to talk about. Um, I'm going to give you a very short introduction on what EDI is, assuming that uh, most of the people uh, know what EDI means. Um, I would will show you, I mean, I, I'm going to talk to you about what each of us has, has done so far in this uh, area in the Odoo ecosystem. Um, I'm going to explain you what do we miss from my point of view. And then I'm going to show you the framework and some Andy modules uh, around the framework. And, and last, uh, in the end, we're going to see uh, a roadmap of this framework. So first point, EDI, what is it? So probably most of you know, but just a quick recap about it. Uh, it's, it means electronic data inter-exchange uh, inter and uh, is basically is a concept to uh, allow two different entities, normally businesses, uh, to uh, exchange uh, data together, communicating through different channels and, uh, and possibly do this in an automated way. Uh, the exchanges can be related to anything in the business flow, so like purchases, sales, invoices, but also uh, shipping information and so forth. Um, there are technical standards to, to deal with such ex exchanges, sort of a, a unified way of representing the data. Uh, one of them is UBL, but you can name also GS1 and some others. Uh, of course, the definition, you, the full definition can be found on Wikipedia here. So now, what have we done so far? Well, most of the time, uh, well, of course, I'm talking from the developer perspective, but also from some, you know, uh, team and units in, in companies. So what I've seen so far is that uh, in my experience, in some colleagues' experience and other companies' experience, we always ended up coding something from scratch, partially or fully, uh, meaning that we might have to you know, integrate a tool for talking to an external system or uh, a tool for generating, I don't know, JSON data, a tool for generating XML file or CSV file and stuff like that. Uh, and we normally ended up uh, copy pasting around project, previous project, existing projects, uh, what we have done in a way or another. And after, Digging into our old projects, uh, we were just plumbing things together in different ways. So making you know, a cron for a specific thing and then updating uh, a state for a specific model and making sure that you get some validation and so forth. Uh, and then repeat. So for every project, we normally do this. So what do we actually need in this kind of uh, projects? Well, to me, we should focus only on what really matters, which is the data mainly, because what we're talking about is exchanging data, and of course, doing something with this data uh, if we receive it. Uh, configuration, so being able just to say, okay, these, uh, type of exchange uh, goes to this external partner or 
uh, I want to uh, talk to, with this external web service or with this external storage, stuff like that. And it should be just configuration, uh, hopefully. And, uh, and then we should code only when we have some really vertical customer specific needs. Uh, and we should be able to keep the code base uh, as small as possible, thanks to the possibility of reusing the many modules that we have to deal uh, for dealing with uh, EDI exchanges in the OCA community. So um, what do we miss to get there? Well, it turns out that we miss quite a lot of things. Um, so, uh, of course, from my point of view, <laughs> we can discuss about this later. But so from my point of view, we miss uh, a centralized management of such uh, exchanges, um, a centralized way, well, a unified way to have automatic transitions of, uh, of, the, of the state of these exchanges and also of the records related to, to these exchanges. Um, we also miss a unified UI and configuration. Uh, and this is actually quite important from my point of view because every time you do, well, you follow the approach that I explained before so that you code something from scratch, that you uh, define a specific tool for the specific use case or the specific customer, you always end up in a way or another with different UI, different way of configuring things, which also makes harder to, uh, for instance, reuse the same documentation for another project or mm, hand over this kind of project to someone else because something has changed for sure. So uh, then what we miss is uh, an easy way to plug the external services without having to uh, code every time an integration of these external tools uh, with the rest of the EDI machinery. Um, another piece that we miss is uh, automatic action. So uh, in normally in this kind of exchanges, uh, you always well most of the time you have to do one of the one or all of them uh of those uh actions that i mentioned there so generating something to be sent out send this something out uh receive something from outside and process what you have received and on top of that you might add validation and other stuff um and another piece that we miss is uh, tracking, especially unified tracking on, on what happened to a specific exchange. Um, and then uh, we miss plugability in the sense that uh, we, when we code something for a specific customer, most of the time we end up on the next iteration uh, with another customer, uh, we end up rewriting a piece because it was not plugable, but it, and you do so just because it has to work for that specific customer. You don't care about any other use case, but that also means that by not spending time in making it plugable, you have to do it I mean, every time. Um, and the last point is, uh, which is a combination of all above issues, that uh, you cannot really reuse these. You cannot reuse what we have done uh, across several application, meaning reuse the same approach for accounting, for uh, sales, for uh, uh, warehouse management, and so forth. So why should we not use uh, the Odoo EDI that is in, in the core? Uh, well, from my point of view, Odoo EDI is not suitable for covering the, uh, the needs that I mentioned, because first of all, it's not a framework. Uh, and as such, has no separation of concerns uh, in terms of where you code the actual machinery that handles the EDI. So today, what you, what you have in Odoo Core is, um, uh, as of today, it's um, only for accounting. And it has been implemented specifically for accounting uh, with some a little bit of configuration like uh, 
an EDI format and stuff like that. But I mean, the, 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 the core of the machinery is attached to the account move, for instance. And last but not least, who knows if this is not going to be refactored two days or one day before V16 goes out. So just saying, but it could happen. Okay, so that's also another key point just to, to make sure that this framework is stable enough to, you know, to be maintainable in the same way uh, for the long term. So uh, let's see what the OCA framework is. Um, first of all, I want to give you a, a quick uh, a summary of, the, of, of what led me to this framework. Um, last year, I, I spent... Uh, one year actually uh, working as a freelancer, um, I quit Camp to Camp, but I had the opportunity to, well, still work for Camp to Camp, but also work with Axon. And during the project I was making with Axon, uh, which, uh, by the way, uh, gave me the opportunity to have uh, to do what I'd like it, uh, to do the thing that I thought it was the the best thing to do. And this is how I ended up ended up using uh, making the OCA framework because. It started exactly in the way that I described it before. So we had to deal with several exchanges, uh, different kind of exchanges. And the first one was a simple one, was a CSV exchanges, exchange. And we had to um, receive a file through SFTP. We had to uh, also uh, expose, uh, export a file in CSV. And we have to put it in SFTP. And we have to deal with the state of this exchange through uh, folders, like uh, uh, you put it in a pending folder. Then the other system put it in the done folder if it's successfully uh, processed uh, or in the error folder. And then you have to keep track of this uh, status through the folders. And, and then you have to keep track of the um, the state of the, in that case, was purchase order. So keep make sure that the purchase order state for the export is correct and stuff like that. And, and of course, implement a cron to make sure that the check is always up there and the data, is, the data is consistent and so forth. So I ended up doing it again from scratch for that particular need. And uh, because I needed a, also a quick prototype for, for that particular case. And then after a while, I had to start to work on the other exchanges that were more complicated. It was about GS1 exchanges for uh, warehouse management, um, where for shipping uh, information. And I realized that I needed the same thing, but a little bit, well, a little bit more flexible and possibly with some more... Um, uh, configuration and be able to adapt it on the fly whenever the, the requirement was changing. Uh, so that's how I came with it. And I said, okay, now it's time to, uh, to change this and stop coding it uh, again and again every time. So this is why we have this framework today. Um, here, I, I'd like to, to give you the picture of the core concepts. Um, so on top of everything, you have uh, a backend and a backend type. The backend type is actually uh, a specific type uh, of exchange. Um, well, probably it's better to refer to it like uh, uh, it could be a protocol, it could be a format say UBL or GS1. So normally you have a backend type, which is generic, no logic attached to it, and, and you define the global type of exchange. Then you have a backend, which uh, can be assigned to, well, should be assigned to a backend type. And it means that uh, with different use cases for the same kind of exchange, uh, you support uh, well, sorry, you could support different type of, ex uh, type of um, communication with external partners with the same type of exchange. So you might have an UBL exchange with a partner A and another type of UBL exchange with partner B, but overall it's just UBL. So uh, that's the generic part. Uh, so in the backend, you can configure the specific type of exchanges that you want to handle. Uh, and this goes through the exchange type, whereas you have Again, 
the definition of the particular format of the exchange. And it's strictly tied to the backend type because you can have an exchange related to UBL and not to GS1. Uh, and the exchange type can be reused on every backend that uh, needs that kind of exchange type, unless you set a specific backend for it. Um, and then you have the exchange record. So the exchange record is actually the real, the single unit that holds the, the, the real exchange. So the exchange record, for instance, is going to contain the, the payload or the, the file content that is going to be sent out. Uh, or is going to contain the file that you received from the external system. Uh, it's going to hold the current state. So if it has been sent, it has been received, it has been processed, and so forth. The other core concepts are the actions that I mentioned before. So most of the time, you're going to have if it's about sending out something, so it's an output, you, you will have to generate something uh, to generate the payload or the file content. Uh, and later on, you will have to send it somehow. It doesn't matter. At this stage, it doesn't matter. And the system doesn't care, as we will see later, doesn't care about how do you send it out. You, know, you don't care if there is an FTP or uh, it's a, uh, a web service doesn't matter. So the action send is uh, agnostic in, in this sense. And the same goes for the receive action that you uh, normally have in the input and, uh, and the process. When you receive something, you will have to process it. And on top of these main actions, you have uh, some secondary actions uh, that you could implement. Uh, you have a check and a validate. For instance, uh, you want to check that um, a file, for instance, in the case of the uh, FTP exchange, you want, might want to check if the file has, uh, is already there or it has been already moved to another folder. And then you have to update the state based on this. Uh, and validation easily. So you receive a CSV file, you want to validate that the schema respects uh, your, um, your requirements, or you want to uh, check that an XML respects some uh, XXD schema, and so forth. Um, a quick summary of the workflow. So imagine that we have configured what we said before. So we have a backend and a backend type for this exchange. So when we want to really do uh, an exchange, uh, in the case of the output, uh, we have an exchange record, which can be generated either by you manually or through uh, a manual action or an automatic action. Um, and once you have a record, that is classified as an output record, then the system is going to look up for these records that are pending and is going to, if properly configured, is going to generate the output automatically based on the exchange type. Uh, as we will see later, but in the, on the exchange type, you have several ways of defining how an exchange should be uh, handled. And uh, you could, for instance, have a template for generating that file. So depending on that type, uh, the system is going to generate the real payload or the file content for this exchange record. And, and once this happens, the, the, the state of this record automatically gets, uh, I mean, it's set to uh, ready to be sent. And uh, and then on the next round, the the, the, the backend through a cron is going to uh, send this output. And of course, later on is going to take care, depending on the type of the exchange and depending on the type of the uh, of the system that you use to send it out, uh, is going to update the state. So it has been sent and pen waiting for get getting processed or sent and that the send was successful or you got an error while sending. Uh, in the same fashion, uh, when you have an input process, then you, you have, again, a record that can be generated beforehand. For instance, when you, you know that you are waiting for something to, get to be received, uh, or, uh, for instance, in the storage mechanism, it happens automatically when you have a specific kind of exchange, you can say, okay, when something lands in this folder, uh, I want it 
to, to get a record generated out of it if it matches a certain file pattern. Uh, and then uh, you get the system to automatically receive the file. Uh, imagine, again, an external storage, you won't read the file from there, and you get the exchange record. And once you get there, of course, the exchange record is uh, transitioned to the proper state, waiting to get processed. And then the system is going to process it, uh, depending on how you set up your exchange type. So how does it work and, uh, behind the curtains? Well, uh, there are some crons that take care of, check, take care of checking um, pending, uh, rec pending input records or pending outgoing records. And uh, the, the jobs are going to ask the backend to handle such records. And the backend is going to schedule some queue jobs to, um, yeah, to do what they have to do with those records. Um, part of the, of the core of the machinery are components. So uh, for each record to handle, the backend is going to look for the best matching component based on the direction, so in, out, uh, based on the backend type, based on a specific action like generate, uh, process, send, and more if you need it. Uh, so which means that you can have, uh, you can pre-configure generic handler for any of those actions. And if, so if there is no specific handler for these, the default one is going to be used. At the same time, if you want to uh, easily override this behavior or take control in certain cases for a specific exchange type, uh, of the component machinery or other parameters, you can have advanced set, you can define some advanced settings on the exchange type configuration, which basically gives you full power on how the exchange type will be handled uh, by the backend. Then as I mentioned before, uh, once the machinery runs and we get to the point where as we found uh, the component that does something with this uh, record, um, once imagine that I call the, 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 the process action and the component handled the, the processing of this um, exchange, then the system automatically moves it to, in the case of the process, it, uh, it moves it to process it successfully and on top of this, you get, of course, the relation with the record that might be affected by this. Like, imagine you are importing uh, sale orders. So the record is, the sale order that's being created through this exchange record gets related to the real sale, rec um, sale order record. Uh, together with also the notification with using the chapter and so forth. So you get always uh, a direct relation between the, the exchange record and the real record that was affected by the exchange. Another important part is that by exchange type, you can configure hack, so uh, an acknowledge uh, record. So imagine, for instance, in the case of the GS1, if you implement the full protocol, you will have plenty of acknowledge. So you send out the file, and the other system sends you back an acknowledge file saying, I received this, and blah, blah, blah. So you can configure this at the exchange type level, uh, level by simply saying, OK, this other kind of exchange type is my acknowledge type. And once you do this, the system automatically, uh, depending on the configuration, is going to create the, uh, the pending acknowledge file uh, exchange record that you will receive later. Or in some other cases, you might want to uh, uh, create the, the ACK file once you receive it for real, for instance. But the system is capable of doing this automatically. And once you do this, so of course, imagine this exchange, you have an input exchange and uh, you receive the file, then the ACK exchange is going to be an output for you because you have to send the ACK out. So this file will be, uh, the exchange is going to be processed later by the system as an outgoing file. So actually, when, 
you get an acknowledge file is going to work in the very same way as the other type of exchanges. Um, here, I want to give you a, a quick overlook on, uh, uh, on how the exchange type uh, looks like. So here you can see that I'm just configuring, for instance, an, uh, an invoice uh, input. Uh, so I'm just saying that um, for this type of the backend, uh, in this case, it's a demo. It could be a UBL, it can be GS1, and as I said before. Uh, then I assign a code, which is going to uh, univocally identify this exchange type. And the code is, uh, is mandatory also because you could um, register components specifically for this type code. Then I state the direction. So in this case, uh, it's an input, so I'm receiving something. Uh, on the right, you see some other parameters. Um, and the first one is the file name pattern. And this is going to be used uh, when you send out the exchange, is going to be used to generate the file name for this exchange. Even if it's, if it's uh, maybe you're calling a web service and you don't care about the file name. So maybe it's just, uh, uh, it's, it's useless in that case. But when you're sending out the file, you're going to get the file name exchange and you can set there the pattern of the resulting file name. But at the same time, the system uh, can use these two, uh, like it happens with the external storage, like uh, FTP, SFTP, is going to use the pattern to look in the specific folder that you configured for a file name matching this pattern. And then it's going to read the file and create an exchange to, with this. Um, and then you can set well, well, it's a file name extension if you want. And uh, if you, you, you can state if this exchange uh, should be automatically generated when it's going out. Uh, and as I mentioned before, you can uh, select uh, uh, an exchange type for the hack, as well as selecting a job channel. Uh, so this gives you, gives you also the opportunity to create and, well, to, to uh, to distribute the load on different job channels by exchange type. Um, at the bottom, you see the advanced settings. Uh, the advanced settings are really advanced and from my point of view, easily to, to configure because it's just YAML. So if you're familiar with YAML, it's easy to, to go there and pass your configuration. In the, in the first case, uh, I'm configuring uh, components uh, and each key there actually matches the actions that I mentioned before. So generate and validate. So I can take control of each step of the automated mechanisms that is going to generate the file or validate the file or process the file. And in this case, I'm saying, look, I don't want for the generate action, I don't want to use the standard component for this. I want to use this component, foo.baz. And among the other things, I want to pass this work context. So if you're not familiar with a component machinery, uh, this is basically passing some default variables uh, in the scope of the component, and then the component can reuse these uh, variables. Uh, and you see a real life example in the second uh, configuration. So for the validation, um, I use a default uh, XML validator, which is available in that repository, so edi.xml. And this one, I'm just saying, OK, use this validator and validate the XML using this schema. And I can pass the schema via configuration. So I don't have to touch anything to have my validation. I just configure this, pass the XSD path, and that's it. And then the system is going to use that to get the validation. On the second tab, it's not showing here, but uh, allows you to define some rules to make uh, some UI action a appear in the right model. So for instance, if this is about invoices, you're going to see some actions on the invoice form to be able to uh, manage this kind of exchange. Now, uh, I want to give you a quick panoramic of some ND modules that are uh, uh, extend these core functionalities. 
Uh, one of the modules that I love the most is EDI Exchange Templates. Um, the reason for having those square brackets uh, around underscore OCA, it's because uh, on version 13, where this work started, uh, we had no complaint from OSA. Uh, well, sorry, we, we didn't know that there was uh, an error on the App Store uh, because back in the days of USA registered the EDI module and then the our name was clashing with that so for version 14 we decided to append underscore OCA uh, anyway EDI exchange template is a module that allows you to configure a template for handling a specific exchange an exchange type so on an exchange type, you can say, OK, to handle the exchange type, you, you should use this exchange template. In the exchange template for mm, uh, output, you can configure it to generate the file or the payload. And you can do this easily with QWeb at the moment. And in case you don't know it, with QWeb, you can generate any kind of uh, Results. So it can be XML uh, or it can be a CSV, it can be a TXT. Okay, it's very flexible. Um, there is also a way to configure uh, input template, but this one is to be finished. Uh, I just drafted it, uh, but it would be nice because using a, a simple code snippet, you will be able to do something with what you receive without having to. Uh, do any uh, developing any any code on server side. Um, then you have the EDI XML, which I mentioned before in the example. Uh, this one allows you to provide default validation through XXD configuration per exchange type, as we have seen. Uh, and it also allows you to uh, uh, parse XML content using the schema. So in the same fashion, you can say that for when you uh, process the file, you can use this component just passing the, uh, the schema and it's going to load the full data in uh, a Python dictionary. Then we have an EDI account, which is a base uh, module uh, by Enrique Tobella for uh, uh, configuring, uh, well, for dealing uh, with accounting on top of the EI framework. Then uh, another important one is the EDI storage as well as the EDI web service. So for the EDI storage, um, it's basically uh, plugging the storage backend. Uh, and for the ones that of you that doesn't know it, we have a repository, which is OCA storage, whereas we have a um, generic module for handling uh, communication with SFTP, S3 storage, or uh, stuff like that. So this module is going to plug this on top of the EDI uh, framework. And from the back end, you can configure the external services that you need. Um, and on top of this, you get the automatic uh, process of the file, as I mentioned before. And, um, and by convention, you can declare the folders that uh, you're going to use for pending files for done files, meaning processed already an error file, and you can configure this in the backend. And when you do this, as soon as a file is processed from the external storage, then it's going to be moved automatically to the right folder. Then we have the EDI web service uh, is used in the same fashion to configure the an, well, um, an external service at EDI backend level. Uh, and then thanks to these, uh, when the send action is going to be, uh, uh, to be called and executed, is going to use the web service setup for issuing the call to the external service, which is the same more or less that happens with the storage. When you get a send, you're going to use the storage backend uh, seamlessly to write the file there. Some other modules, uh, EDI endpoint. Uh, this is pretty recent. I've been working on this in the last months and um, almost getting ready. <clears throat> you can find a work in progress uh, that pull request and it basically allows you to <clears throat> define um, custom endpoints on the fly. So imagine that the customer comes to you and say, yeah, you know, we already have this um, EDI exchange. 
Uh, but now we have to uh, expose an endpoint for a specific partner that is going to send us sale orders. Okay. So without having to code uh, almost anything, you can go there in the UI in the backend, you create an endpoint for this, you set up the path, you set up the type of request that you expect. And, uh, and we have a few lines of uh, snippet code. I will show you uh, in a while you get the exchange done. For uh, UBL, uh, we have already some, uh, it's a work in progress, progress on, as well. Uh, there are some modules to plug the existing OCA machinery. So we have sale order import, we have sale order import UBL, and uh, connected to the EDI endpoint that I mentioned uh, right before, you get a, uh, sale order import UBL endpoint, which offers a, a default editable endpoint for processing sale order um, uh, with UBL. Um, so, and this also tells you that the, the one of the goal of the framework is to be able to reuse the whole ecosystem that we have in the DI repository and just make it possible to plug them smoothly and seamlessly inside the framework. A uh, quick example of how the, the endpoint is going to, uh, to work. So here is from the code, but you can do that from the UI. Uh, and this example is actually taken from the module that I mentioned before. So it works for real. Um, so you just provide your route for the endpoint, uh, request method, content type, what you expect. And of course, on top of this, you get the validation. Uh, then you want to uh, declare the the, how are you going to execute this endpoint? As of today, you just have the code, but it's possibly, uh, I mean, it's feasible to add any other kind of execution mode. Uh, and here you see how you can actually uh, create the exchange, well, handle the exchange. So from line 20 to 21, you're just validating it, reusing what sale order import uh, module already provides, which is the wizard to uh, uh, import uh, ex um, UBL, well, sorry, any kind of sale order uh, through a wizard. Um, and that's it. I'm just using it because it's already there and I can validate the data in this way. Uh, and also, if I get a wrong uh, data, uh, I just write a specific uh, HTTP exception uh, so that whoever calls that service knows what's went wrong. And from line 25 to 27, you see that actually that's all you need to deal with the rest of the framework. Actually, it could be simplified in just one line because what I need is an exchange record. I set the XML data as the content of this change. And then here, I'm, I just have to force the, uh, the state of this exchange um, uh, to input receive. And that's it. Then the system will take care of processing that file when it's time to do it. And as you see at the end, you can send out any kind of response. You can send out a response object. So you have full control of what you're going to send out. So quickly, let's go through the roadmap. Um, uh, the aim is to finish the endpoint machinery that I just uh, presented you, uh, finish the part of uh, being able to configure exchange template for the input, um, go ahead with a UBL integration. Uh, for now, it's just about the sale order, but it's not really hard to, to plug uh, any other um, exchange type. Um, then there is also GS1 integration, which is still uh, in work in progress on version 13. Uh, we just have to uh, yeah, clean up some things and get it merged. Um, then I would like to add a few more things, like <clears throat> uh, being able to, uh, for the end user, well, for the admin, to uh, create some state, custom state, so that you can display um, customer-specific state information uh, via configuration. Um, easily create multiple records with a single file, because today, when you process a file, you have just you have an exchange record. But imagine that you receive a huge file, like, I don't know, a CSV or 
uh, even an XML containing information on several sale orders, for instance. And in that case, um, today you have to create one exchange record, well, sub exchange records for each of those uh, sale orders. Uh, and the trick will be to just have one exchange record, which is the main one, which you can have just today and, and create a um, sub exchange record only to reference the real record that gets created with that specific piece uh, of data that you're using from a multiple file. Uh, then of course, uh, documentation, uh, to be honest, there is not that much documentation. Um, and then, uh, as I said, I mean, one of the goal is to uh, rework uh, some of the EDI modules uh, on top of the framework or simply uh, ease, the, ease the, their integration uh, within this system. So, uh, final words, special thanks to Axon for giving me the opportunity to, uh, to work on this uh, framework uh, one year ago and to actually work on the, the very first implementation. And thanks, for, uh, uh, thanks to er en Enrique to, for helping me with brainstorming, sharing knowledge. Uh, we had several call and chats regarding how to implement, how, yeah, regarding some design decision. And that helped me a lot to change my mind in, in certain cases or to improve things. And he's now actually a, one of the most active contributor uh, for the framework. So thank you guys. And I think it's time for questions. So thanks for listening. And I'm hoping for questions. Uh, Alexandre, or Fred, or am I still here? <laughs> uh, I can... can you hear me? Yeah, now I hear you. Yes. Uh, sorry. Yeah. First of all, thank you for this very interesting talk. I. Uh, I just have a yeah kind of a comment and uh, yeah question to you how you how you uh, how much effort you think it will be to 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 be uh, to be able to to integrate the first GS one integration because uh, whenever I touch this topic of EDI it, it seemed to me uh, to be like a like a mess starting in the in the late sixties uh, of the uh, past century. And then going down the way uh, uh, to today, so that there, there seem to be uh, lots of um, diverting uh, standards in the world. The GS one <laughs> being only one of them. Yeah. So, um, uh, do Do you have any? I mean, first of all, how how much effort do you think it will uh, still take you to to have the first GS one integration ready, and then? Uh, will that be enough to uh, to to cover 80 80 percent of the use cases, or is there is there an, a standard that that still needs to be implemented that is not part of the module set right now? Uh, well, <clears throat> okay. So uh, what I what I show you is actually the framework. Okay, it mm -hmm. doesn't implement any specific. Um, uh, type of exchange being UBL mm -hmm. or uh, GS1, etc. So, in the in the EDI repository, we have plenty of uh, UBL management things, or even FactorX, and yeah, all the modules that you find in the OCI, OCA slash EDI repository. And uh, it should be quite easy to plug them on top of the framework. Specifically regarding the GS1, uh, to be honest, uh, I think we can just merge the state of it as it is. Uh, bear in mind that uh, what we implemented there is uh, just the, <clears throat> the, I don't know if you're familiar with the concept, but uh, you have a, a business header that wraps the every kind of document. And for mm -hmm. the specific part, uh, we implemented the... <clears throat> inbound instruction and outbound instruction. So it's about exchanging the warehouse uh, mm -hmm. state of the receiving goods and sending out goods. Okay, so mm -hmm. just this part is implemented there. The rest is not covered. So that part can be merged in version 13. I just have to get back to it and clean up a few things because uh, some piece of the code changed meanwhile. So I just have to clean up. Uh, but that part is ready uh, and it's, it's a 
let's say a, co a solid base to to go ahead and implementing more GS1 exchanges. Uh, and for the rest, as I said, uh, everything that is in the EDI repository can be easily plugged there. But just to give you, maybe you want me, uh, you see my screen, right? So mm -hmm, I just yeah. want to show you <clears throat> my pending work for sell order import. And I just want to show you how easy it is to do it. So, okay, so this is actually the only thing that you need to plug the generic sell order import into it. So we have a component which is just for processing. <clears throat> I inner it from my EDI component mixing for the inputs, mm -hmm. okay? And then in the process, I use the very same wizard. So here I set up the wizard for sell order import, okay? Mm -hmm. And then I let the wizard do the job because the wizard is already there in the OCA and it's already doing the thing that I want. So I just register this component and it's done for processing it, it's done. Okay. Really intelligent way to do it. Sorry? Really intelligent way to do it. I mean, that's uh, really awesome. Yeah, I mean, and, and on top of this, of course, you can, you can add more things. Like, for instance, uh, I showed you that in the settings, you can, uh, in advanced set, you can provide YAM configuration, right? So in this mm -hmm. case, for instance, imagine that for a particular exchange, you want the sale order to be confirmed. Well, just put there in the setting the sell order import key. And here I check that you pass the confirm order flag. And then if it's what you want, then it gets confirmed here. So on top of this, you can add some extra particular logic just for the framework, but the core is already there in the OCA. Cool. So are there any, any further questions? Is Alexander still with us? I don't know. Uh, I don't Hello. see any question on the but, uh, Sorry, the there, there... mic was off. We have a question from Peter who says, is it possible to have synchronous calls? Synchronous calls in the sense that uh, when you uh, send out something, you mean? I don't have more details. <laughs> uh, possibly, yes. Well, yeah, OK. So in case you send out it says yes. Yeah, I mean, that really depends. Uh, by default, by default, uh, you, you schedule actually an exchange record for being handled later. So then the, the, the real exchange is going to happen in a, in a job. Uh, but if you want that to be to, to, to do it synchronously, uh, you can do it, of course. It's just um, instead of, um, as I showed you before, you can, for instance, uh, sorry, uh, let me get back to that slide. So here, um, instead of doing this, instead of uh, setting the state as input receive, I could set it as input processed. And I could call on the exchange record. I could call action, uh, action underscore process, and you do it in real time. It's the same. Uh, at a, in the same fashion, if you are sending out something, uh, you could do that. So you could, you could create the exchange record and hit the button to process it immediately, depending, of course, on your UI and depending on the case. So let's say that the framework gives you uh, the freedom to do what you want, supporting hopefully all the use cases that you you could implement. Okay, there are a few more questions, uh, but I think you will have to move them to uh, the Discord uh, chat because it's uh, it's two two forty here, yep. and okay. I believe that's the time where. Uh, the next talk is going to start, and it, this will be Joël Grandguillaume uh, speaking about advanced features to handle important uh, projects using the OCA ecosystem. Yeah, okay. Thank you, cool. Simone, for this really great talk. You're uh, welcome. Been a pleasure. And, so, uh, yeah, it will take us some time to digest everything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, anytime. Feel free to reach me uh, on the contacts that they gave. Okay. Peace. Okay. Ciao, everyone. Well.